Hello and welcome back to Be A Loser. So we've pretty well covered everything you'd want to know about carbohydrates, with the notable exception of sugars, which we'll save for last as I'm sure everyone knows they're just the worst. We know that all carbs to some degree stimulate blood sugar and thus blood insulin to deal with it. Things become more complex after that based on fiber and other factors. And this is where the glycemic index and the glycemic load were generated to give us a better idea of how different carbs affect blood sugar. But of course the assumption that blood insulin rose the same degree as blood sugar was shown to be false, and that an insulin index was needed to really see the effects of these carbs on our weight gain. As we know, insulin is king when it comes to weight gain. Many diets were based off of this false assumption because protein and fat stimulate blood sugars minimally or not at all. So these diets, Atkins being the most popular, assumed that you could eat as much fat and protein as you wanted with no effect on weight. Unfortunately, protein and the amino acids that make them do stimulate insulin secretion. This gets pretty complicated, so let's all fasten our seat belts and dive into protein with dairy, red meat, and a little thing known as the incretin effect. as far as the late 60s, there are studies showing the effects of protein on insulin. What was seen was that protein could alter blood insulin levels with absolutely no effect on blood glucose levels. It was also around this time that interest was increasing in hormones produced in the stomach known as incretins. Studies in the late 80s showed that whether glucose was given orally or directly to the bloodstream, blood sugar raised the same amount. So not particularly groundbreaking news there. However, the insulin response was very different. Now drugs are typically given in the bloodstream or intravenously due to the fact that the entire amount of the drug is active. This is known as 100% bioavailability. Oral medications, on the other hand, tend to be partially deactivated by the liver before passing into the bloodstream. But with glucose, the opposite was found. When taken orally, the glucose was far better at stimulating insulin secretion than when given intravenously. Even more odd was that the insulin secretion differed from that of the blood sugars. This led to the discovery of the stomach hormones now known as incretins. These hormones increased the insulin secretion by up to 70% in response to glucose taken orally. This doesn't occur with intravenous glucose as it bypasses the stomach altogether. Now, there are two such incretin hormones in humans, glucagon-like peptide 1 or GLP-1 and glucose-dependent insulinotropic polypeptide or GIP. Oh yeah, that's easy for you to say. The incretin effect starts within minutes of eating and peaks at roughly one hour. Beyond the stimulation of insulin, incretins also inhibit glucagon and delay stomach emptying. This has the effect of slowing down glucose absorption in the body. Researchers were fascinated by this as it showed an entirely new way for protein to stimulate insulin secretion that was not dependent on blood glucose. So of course, they began testing many different types of protein for their incretin effects. As it turns out, dairy products, while stimulating very little blood glucose, do actually increase insulin levels greatly. So is dairy fattening them? Well, most dairy foods have a low GI score, less than 30, but very high insulin index scores greater than 90. So the assumption is that the dairy proteins are causing the problem here. Well, two studies looked at the intake of different proteins to determine their risk of causing type 2 diabetes. As it turned out, increasing intake of all protein, as well as animal protein, did show a slight increase in the risk of T2D. And for those eating more fish, something we're all told to do because of its wonderful omega-3 fatty acids, well, it turns out there is a noticeable increase in T2D with increased fish intake. In fact, for those with very high intake of fish, the risk was increased 24%. However, as far as dairy was concerned, there appeared to be a correlation between eating more dairy 
and losing weight. The Swedish mammography cohort was an observational study that used questionnaires to estimate dairy product intake and compared that to weight changes. There was no increase in weight gain with increased dairy consumption. Specifically, whole milk, sour cream, cheese, and butter were associated with lower weight gain and drinking less low-fat milk equaled gaining less weight. Yes, of course, full fat is always better, right? Now in the US, the CARDIA study measured markers of the metabolic syndrome, including obesity, over a follow-up period of 10 years. The group with the highest intake of dairy seemed to have the lowest incidence of obesity, as well as other markers for metabolic syndrome. Additionally, higher dairy intake seemed to have a protective effect. The study also looked at the role of fiber along with dairy in the diet. They determined that taking high dairy but low fiber, or low dairy and high fiber, increased the risk of insulin resistance syndrome by almost 200%. But taking a low dairy, high fiber diet increased it nearly seven times. Unfortunately, the diet most Americans are told to eat, the SAD or Standard American diet, is fairly low in high fat dairy and due to refined carbs, fairly low in fiber. What this means is that the SAD diet, the doctor and dietitian recommended diet, increases your risk of insulin resistance syndrome by 600%. So all of this seems very confusing. LCH ever say dairy is good because it's high in fat and protein. Paleo followers think dairy should be eliminated totally. Vegetarians believe that red meat and possibly all meat should be eliminated. While Atkins followers believe that red meat is good because it's high in fat and protein. So who's right? Well, focusing on dairy, there are two main points of interest, the incretin effect and the amount of ingested dairy protein. The incretin hormone GLP-1 not only stimulates insulin, but also increases the time it takes for the stomach to empty. If you really think about it, this makes sense. I mean, imagine eating a big steak, protein, versus a big piece of cake, carbohydrate. When you're done, which one will keep you full longer? I'm pretty sure it's the steak. It just sort of sits in your stomach, right? And that's the incretin effect. Refined carbs like the cake or potato chips don't have such an effect, and that's why we feel hungry shortly after we eat them. So here we have a bit of a paradox. Incretins increase insulin, which can cause weight gain. But at the same time, they slow gastric emptying, which could lead to weight loss due to more time between feeding. So which is more powerful? Well, in cases where drugs that mimic the effects of GLP-1 were given, there was more weight loss due to the slowing of stomach emptying. Now, more research needs to be done, of course, as there are other incretin hormones that may or may not have different effects. Now, the other aspect is the amount of dairy protein being ingested. A typical American has roughly 50% of his or her diet coming in the form of carbohydrate. Eating more of this is pretty simple. A few more slices of toast in the morning, second helping of rice or pasta at dinner. And if you want to eat more protein, you can add in more meat or eggs. But dairy protein is actually pretty hard to increase in any significant fashion. Would you eat a block of cheese for lunch? I was stripped of the waist eating a block of cheese the size of a car battery. <laughs> or drink a gallon of milk for breakfast? No, probably not. <laughs> Drinking an extra glass of milk each day doesn't appreciably change the composition of your diet, but cutting down carbs from 50% to 5% is a significant change. Okay, so the point? Sure, dairy stimulates insulin through the incretin effect, but dairy is such a small part of our overall diet that it hardly matters. Now, red meat and other proteins, well, that's a whole different story. You can easily substitute two extra hamburger patties for a bun, or make a sausage crust pizza, or two extra chicken breasts instead of a side of pasta. So which proteins are fattening and which aren't? Well, thankfully, we have many studies to help us figure it all out, sort of. One of the largest studies has come from analysis of the data from three very large studies, the Nurses' Health Studies 1 and 2, as well as the Health Professionals' Follow-up Study. Looking at this combined data, comparison was made between specific foods and the risk of obesity. 
Now in the 70s, we began to try and simplify foods into macronutrients. An avocado, for example, is 79% fat, 16% carbohydrate, and 5% protein with 4.9 grams of fiber. This is why originally, avocados were considered bad. Too much fat. But now, they're considered really healthy. But an avocado has many more nutrients than just these three macronutrients, and so it really defies analysis in this simplistic way. This is why during the low-fat craze, fat was bad. Then carbs were bad. Then there were good carbs and bad carbs. Then good fats and bad fats. And for some, good proteins and bad proteins. Believe me, I was hyper-focused on these macros as well. The problem is that food just isn't that simple. And incidentally, this is also why nutrition labels are mostly useless. So going back to the study, researchers followed subjects over 12 to 20 years and calculated the association between specific foods and weight gain. Overall, the average weight gain over any four-year period was 3.35 pounds, 1.5 kilograms. That's almost right at the expected weight gain per year. Doesn't sound like much, but from age 40 to age 60, you could go from 180 pounds to 220 pounds, obese and pre-diabetic. Now bear in mind that this is an association study. It can't really prove any causation, meaning what exactly is causing the weight gain. But it can show long-term results quite well. If you look at the data, some of it makes sense. Highly processed carbs such as potato chips and french fries, sweets and desserts are fattening. Of course, sugary drinks and fruit juice cause obesity. But there's some data that processed meats also lead to obesity. We know that protein stimulates insulin, but it looks as though meat, more so than dairy, is obesogenic. This once again is most likely due to the quantities eaten. Skim milk has a slight correlation with weight gain, but whole milk does not. Now what begins to become clear is that foods that cause weight gain all stimulate insulin. Those that do not have some protective factor built into them, like fat or fiber. This is where meal replacement shakes, protein powders, and bars fall short. The ingredient list of these is horrifying. Milk, protein, fructose, canola oil, soybean oil. So continuing to look closer at protein, and especially red meat, researchers turned to T2D and the effect of protein on its risk factors. They broke red meat into two categories, processed, and unprocessed. And there was a correlation with both to increased risk of T2D. Put simply, for every extra 100 grams of unprocessed meat, steak for example, the risk of T2D increased 20%. But for every 50 grams of processed meat, bacon and lunch meat, the increased risk was 50%. Just like with carbs, the poison is in the processing. One study showed no connection between unprocessed meats and diabetes or CVD, but a 42% increased risk with processed meats. And another study showed an increase in cancer risk from processed meats, but statistically no increase with unprocessed meats. So eating processed meats is not particularly better for you than eating refined carbs. Zoinks. The poison is in the processing. It starts to make sense, right? Go back to the simple ancestral diets of the Inuits who ate a diet very high in meat and fat. The Okinawans and Kitavans who ate diets high in carbohydrates. What do they have in common? They were not eating processed refined food, be it carbs or meats. So if we look at our simple macronutrient guide, fats, protein, and carbohydrate, we see that protein and carbohydrate both stimulate insulin to varying degrees, while fat stimulates insulin the least. But during the fat-phobic era of the past 40 plus years, we had to reduce fat and increase protein or carbs or both. Now that's a Kobayashi Maru no-win scenario, my friend. The Kobayashi Maru scenario frequently wreaks havoc. Is it any wonder that we became obsessed with calories? It seems as if, as if all foods, regardless of macros, affected us the same. I mean, carbs made us fat. Protein made us fat. And we were told that fat would make us fat. So what the hell do you do? You boil it all down to a common unit, the calorie, and you count those like your life depends on it, to no avail, sadly. The important factor here, and the real point of this video, is that there are protective factors in both carbohydrate and protein. For carbs, it's fiber. And for protein, it's the incretin effect and the gastric slowing. That wonderful feeling of fullness. 
The problem is that our ancient ancestors embraced this feeling. In our fast-paced, fear-based society, we're taught not to. Historically, societies fasted for long periods after very large meals. We simply don't do that anymore. Let's take Thanksgiving as an example for those who live in the States. You eat your huge lunch, and instead of simply acknowledging your fullness and waiting until tomorrow to eat again, you feel the need to make yourself that turkey sandwich for dinner because, by God, you can't miss a meal. My nine-month-old daughter shows me the way every day. When she's done eating what I am feeding her, her lips close up tighter than Fort Knox. She will not eat anymore when she's full. Same goes for animals. My dog won't eat her food just because I put it in her bowl. If she's not hungry, she doesn't eat, even if she only ate once that day. The horror, the horror. The point we must take away from this is that there are no inherently bad foods, just processed ones. The further away from whole, real food your diet is, the more dangerous it is for you. Protein bars? Don't do it. Meal replacement shakes? Uh, no thank you. Processed meats and carbs? Avoid them as best you can. But it's difficult today to avoid them completely. So as with fasting, there are other ancient protective factors that have been forgotten to help us cleanse our bodies and remain healthy. And those, too, we will discuss as we continue through this series. So, if you're new to the channel, please subscribe and enable alerts by clicking the bell so that you know when new videos post. And if you like this video or any of my videos, please click the like button as it does help the channel gain exposure. Also, consider sharing the videos with family, friends, and those who need the information. It's important that we change the mainstream ideas about diet and nutrition, even if it is one person at a time. As always, Thanks so much for watching, and until next time, keep being a loser.